Good morning. This is Northern Light for Wednesday, May 3rd. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. After 34 days of delays, New York lawmakers approved a $229 billion state budget last night. We'll have a look at what's in the spending plan just ahead. And Governor Hochul signed two new bills into law yesterday to protect reproductive health. Try to be that model for other states of what we can do when the federal government and forces in Washington and other states go in a different direction. We'll do it differently here in New York. Also, we'll meet a group of transplants to Ogdensburg about why they wanted to move to the city. One newbie says she spends a lot of time at the Ambets and American Legion. One of the main things that I love about the North Country is that I love to dance, and there's so many fun honky-tonks around here where you can go out dancing on a Sunday afternoon, on a Friday night, a Saturday night. And Chef Curtis joins us to share some of the finer points of a delectable chocolate recipe. You know, this is where chefs geek out a little bit. And so I'm going to I'm going to have my pinky out and my geek on for a bit. (laughs) All that's coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by Mountain Orthotic and Prosthetic Services, a full-service practice committed to providing care for patients of all ages with offices in Lake Placid, Plattsburgh, and Malone. Details and referrals at mountainonp.com. And by Fort De La Presentation, home of the Abbey PK Walking Trail, open seven days a week from sunrise to sunset, fort1749.org. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. State lawmakers approved a $229 billion budget last night. It's over a month late. And as Karen DeWitt reports, the spending plan also contains many new policy changes, ranging from what energy sources can be used for new buildings to raising the minimum wage. Among the many changes to state policies are measures aimed at combating climate change. One would require fully electrified new homes. That means they don't use any other fuel source starting in 2026. New buildings of any kind would have to follow that beginning in 2028. A plan issued late last year by the Hochul Administration's Climate Action Council recommended the changes. The council also proposed that the state discontinue the sale of all new natural gas appliances, including gas stoves, by 2035 and forbid new gas hookups in existing buildings after 2030. But Governor Hochul says those provisions, which became controversial, are not part of the final budget agreement. I want to be very clear. I know people love to misinterpret this, but people with existing gas stoves, you're welcome to keep them, stay where you are, do what you please. And Hochul says there will be some exemptions for the new construction. Restaurants, for instance, would still be allowed to have gas hookups for their stoves. Republicans who are in the minority party in the legislature say there are not enough provisions to build out the electricity grid to make up for all the extra power that will be needed if gas and other fuels like home heating oil are discontinued. Assemblyman Philip Pomizano says the changes limit free choice and ratepayers will have to shoulder the additional costs. This is really more government control, uh, taking away total energy choice for the consumer, Uh, putting all our eggs in one basket for electrification, and it's really socialized energy policy. Hochul says the budget sets up a mechanism that will eventually offer rebates to consumers. They can then buy clean energy appliances and heating systems, and it could also lower utility costs. A cap and invest program would be created. It would require greenhouse gas producers to pay a fee for any emissions that they produce above a limited cap set by the state. Those fees could generate an estimated $1 billion. Number one, in my opinion, was to be able to give rebates back to ratepayers to help them offset 
their costs as well as purchasing the energy efficient appliances. The budget also revises the state's bail reform laws to give judges more discretion to hold defendants pre-trial. It eliminates a clause that required judges to use the least restrictive means when considering whether to set bail for a bail eligible crime. Republicans who say the bail reform laws were a major factor in the state's pandemic era crime wave say the new revisions don't go far enough. Assemblyman Michael Tanasis is from Staten Island. These are not the changes that we need in order to better our quality of life. Assemblymember Latrice Walker, a Democrat, bucked her party's leadership to speak against the bill. Walker, who's been on a hunger strike for the past three weeks to show her opposition to the changes, says there is no data that shows the bail reform law has contributed to the increased crime rate. She says the revisions will fracture families and communities and reignite mass incarceration. The budget that we are being asked to vote on in large part will lock more people, more black and brown people up and more poor people pre-trial as a solution to a political problem. And that's something that I simply cannot support. Under the budget, the minimum wage will be going up by 2026 to $17 an hour in New York City and $16 in the rest of the state. After that, it will be automatically increased each year at the rate of inflation. The state will be given new authority to crack down on illegal cannabis shops that are competing with the slowly emerging legal marijuana sales industry. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. Advocates for reproductive health are hailing two pieces of legislation signed into law yesterday by Governor Kathy Hochul. One ensures that all SUNY and CUNY students in New York have access to a common abortion pill. The other allows pharmacists to dispense birth control over the counter. Speaking to reporters in Albany yesterday, Hochul says while the federal government and other states are restricting, abor- uh, excuse me, restricting reproductive rights, New York will remain a sanctuary and continue to expand access. Try to be that model for other states of what we can do when the federal government and forces in Washington and other states go in a different direction, contrary to the values on which this country was founded, we'll do it differently here in New York. Neharika Rao, a lead organizer for the group Reproductive Justice Collective, joined Hochul at the podium. New York will champion our bodily autonomy and young people will always have access to abortion care in New York. Hochul signed the bills on the one-year anniversary of the leaked draft Supreme Court opinion that eventually overturned Roe v. Wade. The re-energy plant in Fort Drum is closing, and most of their 28-person staff will be laid off. The re-energy plant makes electricity from logging scraps. The future of re-energy has been uncertain since 2016, when cheaper natural gas lowered the price of electricity and forced the plant to go offline. As of 2019, New York does not consider biomass a renewable energy source, meaning the plant would no longer receive tax credits from the state. The plant has decided to shut down, and the last day on the job for workers will be this Friday, May 5th. Persistent and heavy rain over the last couple weeks is causing Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River near Montreal to rise rapidly. But hydrologists say the levels are not expected to reach the flood levels experienced in 2017 and 2019. The International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board says Lake Ontario has been rising by almost an inch a day. The lake is currently at 247 feet, more than a foot above the long term average, but it's a foot and a half below the record high of 2017. Water regulators adjusted the gates of Iroquois Dam near Ogdensburg yesterday to prevent extremely high water in Lake St. Lawrence, the area just upstream from the hydropower dam in Messina. The Ottawa River is also high, so the St. Lawrence River it empties into has risen to almost 73 feet at Montreal, about a foot above the long-term average. The board says it will continue to monitor the situation.
You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It is coming up on 10 minutes past 8. Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Just ahead, we've got a simple chocolatey dessert idea from Chef Curtis Hem. That recipe in just a few minutes right here on Northern Light. Music by Colton guitarist Paul Myers. And just a reminder that he's giving a concert with his World on a String trio coming up at the Edwards Opera House on Saturday, May 20th, 7 p.m. You can check out more about the concert and get tickets at edwardsoperahouse.com. That's Paul Myers along with the World on a String trio at Edwards Opera House coming up Saturday, May 20th, 7 p.m. More information at edwardsoperahouse.com. Northern Light is supported by Blue Seed Studios, a multidisciplinary art center featuring classes for adults and youth, concerts, art exhibits, and more, blucstudios.org. And by St. Lawrence Nurseries in Potsdam, providing the North Country with cold, hardy fruit and nut trees for nearly 100 years, slngrow.com. Governor Kathy Hochul says her office was aware that a room in the state legislative office building is being used as an unofficial daycare for lawmakers' kids. It came to light in an article by the Times Union, which reported the daycare may have been operating without standard oversight and licensure. Hochul was asked about it yesterday. And this was a drop-in center, which has different standards than a all-day-long uh, child care center or daycare center, as we so Uh, We put them in contact with the Office of Child and Family Services to let them know what the guidelines were if they did want a full-time stand-up daycare center and what they needed. So so we've been aware. Yes, we've been aware. Leaders like Democratic Assembly Speaker Carl Hastie have defended the arrangement, saying it's a benefit offered to members and that the legislature doesn't want to discourage members with children from serving. The fire tower on top of Polka Moonshine Mountain south of Plattsburgh was vandalized last month. The not-for-profit that maintains the structure is looking for more information about who may be responsible. According to the Friends of Polka Moonshine, vandals broke the lock on the tower door between April 3rd and April 10th. The Friends group says vandals climbed to the top detached the replica firefinder table map from its base and then took off with it. The not-for-profit reported the damage to New York State forest rangers who are helping with the investigation. They're asking for people to look out along the trail for the two-and-a-half-foot disc and report report any information to 833-NYS-RANGERS. The city of Ogdensburg is turning 155 years old. And over the weekend, a group of transplants to the area helped organize a small celebration at the Dubisky Center on the St. Lawrence. We caught up with these Ogdensburg newbies about why they wanted to celebrate the city. Wherever you live, it's worth celebrating. We have the beautiful St. Lawrence River. What's not to celebrate? You know, so clean air, beautiful river, fabulous people. It's, it's everything to celebrate. My name's Wendy Hamilton, and I live here in the Burke. And I've lived in Pennsylvania. I've lived in Saskatchewan. I've lived in South Carolina. That's where I came from. I moved here from South Carolina. And the first thing anybody says is, why? And you know what's interesting? Life isn't all about good weather. You have to find your people. You have to be comfortable in the community that you're living in. And... I I feel comfortable here, and I think, uh, you know, I found my people. What brought you to the area? Well, actually, I wanted to move to Canada. I'm from Canada, and I wanted to move along the St. Lawrence in Canada, but COVID had other plans, and there was really nothing available. So I started to look on this side, and then my brother said to me, wasn't our grandfather born here? And I looked into it, and yes, he was born here in Hogdensburg. So it was fate, and I said, all right. It's not where I want to be, but it's where I am. So, all right, dig in. Let's have it. Come on. And I started seeking out all the other newbies here in town. And we have a group called the Ogdensburg Newbies and Wise Guides. So in that group, I I stalked people on Facebook who said, oh, I'm new here. Does anyone know? And so I would DM them and say, I'm new too. And we've got a group. Um, We're going to, I think we're going to see good things here. I'm 
I'm going to help make it happen <laughs> because I have to, because I live here. You know, I'm not going to go and close my door. You're not going to do that and say, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. Let's drive to Ottawa for everything. Let's go to Watertown. for No, no, we're going to bring it here. We're going to make it happen here. Kathleen Weir, W-E-I-R, used to be Kathleen Langto, so... If, if anybody recognizes that name. I still have a brother and a sister here, so a lot of family. I went to high school here. So that is my whole experience of being an Ogdensburg native. And then I left, and I came back 40 years later. I spent three decades in California. I lived in Colorado, New Mexico, Oregon, Florida. Been around. And... Um, I decided after 30 years in L.A. that I really didn't like the weather. So I needed to come back to where the seasons are. There's something magical about the light here. The light is amazing here. And geographically, I feel like it's the right place for me. Like I'm grounded. Like, like, or geologically, geographically, I don't know how to say it, but spiritually. And the fact that the Amish live here... So it's two sets of people in the same place in different times. That's magical. And I think there's a portal somewhere around here. (laughs) I do. I do. And I I love it here. I love the seasons. There's not a day. I don't complain about the weather. I love the weather no matter what it is here. I love it. So I'm happy and trying to get my adult children to move out here. They're in their 30s. So far the answer is "Mm, maybe. (laughs) One of the main things that I love about the North Country is that I love to dance, and there's so many fun honky-tonks around here where you can go out dancing on a Sunday afternoon, on a Friday night, a Saturday night. There's an Amvets in Hubleton. There's one in Lisbon. There's one in uh, Governor. You'll see people in their 60s, 70s. I sat next to a lady the other night that's 86, and she was up on that dance floor every time, every song, fast or slow. So that's a good energy for me, too, that I'm thriving on here. i got to get these two to go out dancing soon. Absolutely, uh, Leah. <laughs> you just tell everyone that I love dancing. I'm, I'm there. Yeah, right. <laughs> so my name is C.T. Ayler. I live close to the gorgeous post office. I didn't really move here by choice, to be honest. Uh, I imported my American husband across the border to Canada. Then when Colvin hit, he was forced back to stay here because he works for the Department of Defense. And I had said, let's just try to find a place as close to the border. And honestly, it was Ogdensburg looking at the houses, looking at the property. Ken, my husband, had come up here a few times and he said, this is a really nice place. I see kids playing in the street and I think we should move here. And then, of course, we fell in love with our home. It's a little bit big for me. (laughs) You know, there sounds like there might be a bit of a negative attitude about the town, but I think Wendy was right when she said there's a fatigue from all of the hardships, but If you start talking to them, yeah, but look at the park here, look at this, you can see a little bit of pride start to happen. Like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, this is a great town. It's like, yeah, you haven't left, right? So obviously it's still pretty good. And they're like, yeah, 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 you're right. (laughs) It's just like just reminding them that there's a reason why they're still here and I think it gives them a sense of feeling some pride, some civic pride again. So important. Those are Ogdensburg residents Wendy Hamilton, Kathleen Weir, and C.T. Ayler.
You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandresky. In just a minute, Chef Curtis Hem shares a recipe for a favorite chocolate dessert that's coming up in just a couple of minutes. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note just ahead at 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. More rain in our forecast today, but uh, by the weekend, things will start to clear up and warm up with the highs today around 50. The Weather Service says a 95% chance of light rain continuing today, 45% chance of scattered showers tonight. Uh, Lows near 40 overnight tonight, then tomorrow, partly to mostly cloudy, highs in the 50s with Thursday. And then Friday, uh, partly sunny skies, a high near 60, and we'll see partly to mostly sunny skies Saturday and Sunday with a high in the 60s on Saturday and a high near 70 on Sunday. And it looks like sunshine in the extended forecast into early next week as well with highs in the upper 60s near 70. Right now in Canton, showers, 42 degrees. Just in time for Mother's Day or a sudden craving for chocolate, Chef Curtis Hem has a simple recipe for creamy, chocolatey dessert with only four ingredients. Chef Curtis owns the Char- Carriage House Cooking School in Peru, New York, and is the executive chef at the View Restaurant at the Mirror Lake Inn Resort and Spa in Lake Placid. And he joins us each month to share a favorite seasonal recipe. He told our Todd Moe that his peau de chocolat is a simple recipe recipe that you can make in one pot. For me, you know, this is where chefs geek out a little bit. And uh-huh. so I'm going to I'm going to have my pinky out and my geek on for a bit. So <laughs> it's a it's a custard because it's cream and egg. And the custard is flavored by the chocolate. So that's how I look at this. It's it's no different than say a quiche minus the egg whites, but it's a custard. It's a cooked custard because we do it all in one pot and we cook the we cook the egg yolks in the ganache, you know, to a certain temperature um, or feel. And then it sets up. So for me, it's a custard. It's, you know, very much like a uh, a chocolate. I won't say a hollandaise, but it's a chocolate pudding, you know, in, in that sense. Chef Curtis, give us some tips on what to look for when you're buying chocolate for, for a dish like this. I'm always a little intimidated, not so much by the process, but what do I look for when I go to that aisle, the baking aisle in the, in the grocery store, and I see lots and lots of different, you know, from chips to bars to powders, you know, where, where do you go for, for good chocolate? Since chocolate isn't made locally, I, I'm, I'm not offending anybody right, here. Right. I buy Ghirardelli, 60% dark chocolate. I like the product a lot. I like the texture of it. I love the consistency of it. We use it at the Carriage House for almost all of our chocolate dishes because it's so readily available to everybody. And that's something that I always factor into recipes that I write or design. Are the ingredients accessible? Mm -hmm. And if they're not, then there's really no point in using those. You know, if you have to mail order foie gras or this special Swiss chocolate, it's just not going to be a recipe I endorse. So... And chips versus, you know, getting a bar and breaking it up into pieces is... It won't matter. Once you heat it, it's going to melt. Yeah. I use chocolate chips because they melt consistently and they're a consistent size. So if you break a bar of chocolate, you're going to have different sized pieces of chocolate that will melt at different times. And I'm, as a chef, I'm in the consistency game. So that's one of the things I pride myself on is being very consistent and having a consistent result. And so chips are a uniform size, a uniform weight, and a uniform quality. What I like about this recipe is that there's no sugar listed unless, as you say, kind of like a, an, an option. Correct. And so your chocolate, the 60% dark chocolate from Ghirardelli, has sugar added to it. Uh-huh. You do not need more sugar. And again, I am not into super sweet desserts. Uh-huh. So I'm also not into you know, really bitter 80% dark chocolate cacao because someone said it was healthy. I I want to enjoy what I eat as well. So there's enough sugar in the 60% that I don't need to go further. I don't need to add sugar to it. You could add a tablespoon or two of Bailey's Irish cream or a local bourbon cream to that or Grand Marnier or something. You could certainly add those. Those have residual sugars as well. Even brandy has that. Okay, so we could we can kind of go through the steps if you want, but I know there's one thing that I've sometimes heard about when you're adding egg yolks to a, a, a warm or a hot dish is the risk of what, scrambling the eggs? So the egg yolk will curdle, but the fact that you have cream in the base mixture 
will automatically raise the curdling temperature 40, 45 degrees. So really? there's very little risk of curdling this. Now, if you do, if you're boiling your ganache <laughs> and you throw in your egg yolks, you will get scrambled egg yolks. Right. So let's just walk through. I use a very small, I use a nonstick skillet for this. It's not very big, two quarts possibly. I reduce the heat to low and, you know, I add the chocolate, stir gently. I, I, I kind of put those first few ingredients in there, the cream, the chocolate chips and the butter. There's three types of fat in those three ingredients. And what you're trying to do is get those fats to emulsify. And that only happens at the same temperature. So you have to, you have to get your chocolate, butter and cream to the same temperature. And then you kind of whisk that together. Once that's done, you get a ganache and it will, it will look like you break it at first. So it'll look like, Oh my, I really messed this up. It's terrible. You know, I've got, you know, the sloppy cream mess with chocolate and melted butter. And if you keep doing that, what's going to happen is those three fats will start to emulsify and they're going to pull their light partners into this emulsification and it will start to become shiny. And then you're going to have this really glossy, nice ganache. Then you take that off the heat and you add in your egg yolks. And then you bring it back to the heat gently. I kind of use an infrared thermometer. I do it by feel for the most part now. You want to get it to about 145 degrees. Then you take it off the heat. You put it into your cups. And that's it. It, it really is the simplest of desserts. And it's a great one to start kids with, too, because it's pretty temperature safe. You're not really risking burning them or anything else like that. And then you can garnish it with some things as well. Yeah, you could do whipped cream. You could, you know, if you didn't want to hand whipped cream, you could buy the whipped cream canisters. They make ready-made uh, whipped cream packets. Um, you could just do it yourself. I like a little dusted sugar. I do keep a 70% dark chocolate bar on hand, and I use a microplane. I will grate that on top of it. I think I might have sent that to you in a picture. Yep. I like you know, shortbread cookies, uh, just classic shortbread cookies. They don't have to be expensive. I also like biscotti. Um, you can dunk into that, use the biscotti as a spoon. Same with the cookies. You know, it really is very, very friendly to how you want to eat it. And quite honestly, when there's stuff left in there, I just use my finger and I go around the inside of the bowl. <laughs> what can I say? This recipe <laughs> just makes me smile. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, you know, it's a it's a really fun dessert to make. <laughs> I do them for banquets a lot because it's so easy. You know, we do them at the carriage house all the time. I, I just enjoy it. And you could change the dark chocolate for white chocolate. Sure. You can do butterscotch just the same. It really is a, a fun thing to do. And like I said, you know, with the addition of some adult alcohols, you could really have some fun with flavors. Chef Curtis Hem owns the Carriage House Cooking School in Peru, New York, the Champlain Valley, and he's the executive chef at the View Restaurant at the Mirror Lake Inn Resort and Spa in Lake Placid. And a little later this morning, we'll post the, the recipe and the photo of that chocolate uh, chocolate pudding that uh, he so lusciously described for us just a moment ago on our website at ncpr.org. It's 28 minutes past 8. Monica Sandreski, how do you say that again? Peau du chocolat? Peau du chocolat, yes, Ooh. I know. I gotta try it. Very French. Yes, well, so many events, yeah, I gotta try it too. There's so many events going on throughout the community. Uh, lo the local arts festival in Potsdam is continuing today a focus on poetry with the writer and performance poet Alan Wolf throughout the day today. Uh, this morning from 11 to 12.15, he's uh, going to be doing an interactive out-of-this-world introduction to our solar system and beyond. He'll bring to life each planet with its own personality. Members of the audience become world-famous astronomers of the present and past. You can help put the soul in solar system. Um, today at the Dunn Theater. That's this morning from 11 to 12.15. Then this afternoon at the Potsdam Public Library. Enjoy the poetry Palooza. Get immersed in verse. He'll be mixing uh, theater, music, and audience participation. That's from 4.30 to 5.30 at the Potsdam Public Library. And of course, you can find out more about the Loco Arts Festival at potsdam.edu slash loco. 
Also stop by the Downtown Artist Cellar in Malone Friday night from 4.30 to 7. They're kicking off their Young Artist in Action Art Exhibit. Partnership with Adirondack for Kids and the Downtown Artist Cellar. That reception is open to everyone Friday night. This Friday night from 4.30 to 7. And the exhibit is up until May 20th at the Downtown Artist Cellar in Malone. That's it for Northern Light on this Wednesday, May 3rd. Morning Edition continues in just a minute. Then stick around for the Marketplace Morning Report at 8.51. Until tomorrow, I'm Monica Sandreski. I'm Todd Moe. Thanks for listening. Be well.